So today, churches throughout the world have identified as Orphan Sunday. To celebrate with our brothers and sisters of faith, it might seem odd that I would continue in our series, 66 books, 66 messages, and preach from Second Chronicles on Orphan Sunday. But let me lay out for you some context. Old Testament Israel was only united under three kings, Saul, David, and Solomon. And at the end of Solomon's reign, it divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. First and second kings focused more on the northern kingdom of Israel, whereas first and second chronicles emphasized the tribe of Judah. By all means, the history narratives contain a number of similarities, but the purpose behind the telling of these histories differ. We might compare it to the way in which we read the synoptic gospels. They provide similar details, but the authors communicate information differently because they are addressing different audiences. Ezra is most commonly regarded as the author of Chronicles, and he writes to a post-exilic people. In fact, in the Hebrew Bible, First and Second Chronicles appear as the last book. The Jewish remnant returned from exile to a ruined Jerusalem and a destroyed temple. But Ezra was wanting to inspire a renewed spirit of biblical worship. Through a listing of extensive genealogies, the chronicler reminds this new generation that Yahweh had been their help in ages past and that Yahweh would be their help in times to come. Think of it this way. Despite evidence of their sinful disobedience, God leads his people out of exile in order to rebuild the temple and to bridge the gap for us as New Testament believers, Jesus Christ leads us out of exile from sin so that we might become the living temple. Understanding this basic background helps us to more appropriately and more accurately interpret the genealogies and the histories from First and Second Chronicles. Emerging from the pages behind each text, Ezra asks a group of delivered Old Testament exiles the same question everyone belonging to Christ's church is now asked. What spirit shall define you? This morning, I draw your attention to that very question through the reading of 2 Chronicles chapter 28, Verses 1 through 15. What spirit shall define us? Again, I'm in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. And this is God's word to his people. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and sacrificed his children in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Therefore, the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Aram. The Arameans defeated him and took many of his people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted heavy casualties on him. And one day, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, killed 120,000 soldiers in Judah, because Judah had forsaken the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Zikri, an Ephraimite, Warrior killed Masiah, the king's son, Ezrikim, the officer in charge of the palace, and Elkanah, 
Second to the king, the men of Israel took captive from their fellow Israelites who were from Judah 200,000 wives, sons and daughters. They also took a great deal of plunder, which they carried back to Samaria. But a prophet of the Lord named Oded was there and went out to meet the army when it returned to Samaria. He said to them, because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, was angry with Judah, he gave them into your hand. But you have slaughtered them in a rage that reaches to heaven. And now you intend to make the men and women of Judah and Jerusalem your slaves. But aren't you also guilty of sins against the Lord your God? Now listen to me. Send back your fellow Israelites you have taken as prisoners, for the Lord's fierce, fierce anger rests on you. Then some leaders in Ephraim, Azariah, son of Jehoianan, Berechiah, son of Meshilamoth, Jehezekiah, son of Shalom, and Amasa, son of Hadlai, confronted those who were arriving from the war. You must not bring those prisoners here, they said, or we will be guilty before the Lord. Do you intend to add to our sin and guilt? For our guilt is already great, and his fierce anger rests on Israel. So the soldiers gave up the prisoners and plunder in the presence of the officials and all the assembly. The men designated by name took the prisoners, and from the plunder they clothed all who were naked. They provided them with clothes and sandals, food and drink, and healing balm. All those who were weak they put on donkeys, so they took them back to their fellow Israelites at Jericho, the city of Palms, and returned to Samaria. So ends the reading of God's word. Our passage this morning breaks down for us, I think, in two parts. On the one hand, a spirit of goats, and on the other hand, a spirit of sheep. And my reading of the text in this way is shaped by the parable of the sheep and the goats that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Christ calls goats those who do not minister to any of the least of these. And Jesus says goats have no part with him. Conversely, Christ calls sheep those who care for others in need with a loving touch. By ministering to people, Christ says they are actually ministering directly to him. So I ask yet again, which spirit will define you? It is safe to say that Ahaz falls into the category of a goat. He is a goat not just because of his, his failure to show mercy to others. He is a goat because of his blatant disregard for God's word in general. Among the kings of Judah, he alone merits the entirely negative judgment of never having done right in the eyes of the Lord. His sacrilege knows no bounds. The text tells us that King Haaz followed in such detestable acts as offering children to idols like Baal, Ashtoreth, and Molech. We would be foolish and we would be naive to suggest that barbaric practices like these no longer continue in a civilized culture. The World Health Organization reported that more than 1.2 million abortions were performed worldwide in the first 10 days of this calendar year. Let that number sink down in your hearts and minds for just a moment. In less than two weeks to start this year, over one million babies were denied the opportunity for life. Proverbs 31 verse 8 instructs us to speak up for all those who cannot speak for themselves. So I will speak up for the unborn because I embrace the teaching of God's word. Psalm 139, verse 13 reads, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. 
Isaiah 44, 24 declares, Thus says the Lord your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. The Lord says in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed you in your mother's body, I chose you. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, John the Baptist leapt in the womb of his mother. Nevertheless, as I've declared before from this pulpit, I say it again today, being pro-life is not merely a matter of advocating for the justice of babies in utero. Pro-life extends well beyond that to a number of other issues, and one of those issues pertains to the orphan crisis. Around 450,000 children are registered right now in the United States in the foster care system. 125,000 of them are already presently available for adoption. The Department of Justice estimates that every year, 1.7 million teens will experience some form of homelessness in the United States. 1.7 million. Worldwide, there are over 153 million orphans. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc in our world, no doubt, but it has also contributed to the spike among orphaned children. India currently has the most, with 30 million in need of a forever home. Unadopted kids either pass from foster family to foster family or they remain in underfunded orphanages until they age out of the system. And aging out of the system is twice as likely to happen with children who have disabilities. Most children who age out of the system will be placed in vulnerable situations, often forced to fend for themselves on the streets. So I will always speak up for the orphan because I embrace the teaching of God's word. Isaiah 1 verse 17 calls for us to learn to do good, to seek justice, and to correct oppression, to bring justice to the fatherless, and to plead the widow's cause. James 1.27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Moses warns in Deuteronomy 27, verse 19, Cursed is he who distorts the justice due unto the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Proverbs 24, verse 11 and 12 plainly states, Rescue those who are being taken away to death. Hold back those who are stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, Behold, we do not know this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who keeps watch over your soul know it? And will he not repay man according to his work? That final text from Proverbs chapter 24 echoes the words from the prophet Oded. Essentially, Oded tells the Israelite army that they know what is right and that they know what is wrong. And fortunately, God's word takes residence in their hearts and they embody the spirit of sheep that Jesus references in Matthew chapter 25. I want to read again verse 15 from our text. The men designated by name took the prisoners and from the plunder they clothed all who were naked. They provided them with clothes and sandals, food and drink and healing balm. All those who were weak they put on donkeys. So they took them back to their fellow Israelites of Jericho, the city of Palms, and returned to Samaria. You know, God is a providential God. And Chris asked me, I don't know, maybe a, a few weeks back if someone from a Good Samaritan could speak to our fellowship. 
And to be honest with you, I'd forgotten. And he communicated with me this week, you know, do we have time for the Good Samaritan person to speak to our fellowship? And, and I said, yes. And so we were blessed to hear just a smidge this morning from her and more later to come. But I will tell you that most biblical commentators believe that 2 Chronicles 28, verse 15 served as the impetus behind Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan. Although Israel was deeply divided from Judah during this time, they proved themselves as a neighbor in this account, much in the same way that the Samaritan proves himself a neighbor to the Jew who had been beaten and robbed in Luke chapter 10. Israel treats the captives of Judah not as slaves, but as brothers and as sisters. The point is ultimately this. For a brief moment, Israel is what Israel is supposed to be. For a brief moment, Israel is what Judah is supposed to be. For a brief moment, Israel acts like the true people of God, and it is what the church is supposed to be. Sheep, not goats. The tale of the starfish is adapted from Lauren Isley's The Star Thrower. And it starts when a young girl is walking along a beach where thousands of starfish had been washed up during a terrible storm. When she came to each starfish, she would pick it up and throw it back into the ocean. A crowd of people just watched in amusement. She had been doing this for some time when one man finally approached her and said, Little girl, why are you doing this? Look at this beach. You can't save all these starfish. You can't begin to make a difference. The girl for a moment seemed crushed and deflated. But after a few moments, she bent down. She picked up yet another starfish and she hurled it as far as she could into the ocean. Looking up at that man, she replied, well, I made a difference for that one. And the old man thought about what the little girl had said, and he thought about what she had done. And greatly inspired, he then joined the little girl by throwing starfish back into the sea. And before too long, others from the crowd followed suit until all the starfish had been saved. Listen, I mentioned earlier that the orphan crisis in our world, 153 million. It is a staggering number. It is a number that we could let deflate us. But what if I gave you yet another staggering number? According to various research groups, the world's largest religion remains the Christian faith, practiced by 2.4 billion people. 2.4 billion greater than 153 million. Do you want to know the answer to the world's orphan crisis? It's the church. Being sheep not goats. Then the king will say to the sheep on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you is the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, 
Whatever you did for one of these, the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. What spirit will define us? Spirit of sheep or spirit of goats? How is God calling you right now to make a difference in someone else's life? It may not be adoption, but none of us are excused. Not one. Not if we belong to King Jesus. Pray with me. Lord, today, today remind us of your great calling. Remind us that we are called, if we are called by your name, to touch other people with a loving hand, to maybe stretch ourselves beyond ways that we really even thought we were capable of doing. It's not always easy. As a matter of fact, it's often hard. But I don't want us to be overwhelmed by the problems we see around us. May we pick up one and throw it back into the ocean. We can make a difference for one. What one will we make a difference for right now? Christ be glorified in this place, among your people, and for your glory. I pray in your name. Amen. I know this much to be true. Christ's church is to be the song to the nations. We are to be the song to the nations. And that is our hymn of response today, hymn 365, song for the nations. If God is calling you to make a decision today, whatever that decision might be, as we stand to sing together, the altar is open.